can see and you want to go back to it. Okay, we're now, now recording. Yes, so the Foundations of Animal Sentience project is really aimed at two main questions. How do we study the subjective experiences of animals scientifically? And how do we put the science of animal sentience to work to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals? So there's this science facing side and this policy facing side. The policy facing side has been in the news quite a bit recently because of our advice to the UK government to protect some invertebrate animals in animal welfare law. But this talk is gonna be focused on the, the science facing side of the project, this question of how we can develop better methods for doing consciousness science on a wide range of non-human animals, including, I think, invertebrates. We should be doing consciousness science on invertebrates like bees. So conscious being has a subjective point of view on the world and on its own body. I like this idea of a, of a point of view as a way of int introducing what it is we're trying to explain when we're trying to explain subjective experience. There's a picture that uh, Fred Kaiser first showed to me from Ernst Mack's book, The Analysis of Sensations, where he's trying to capture his own conscious point of view on the world. Of course, he's only capturing a little part of it there because he's only capturing the visual part and really our, our the conscious point of view we have in subjective experience includes far more than just a visual point of view. There's also all the other senses and the evaluative side as well, you know, emotions, feelings. All of that is captured in this idea of a subjective point of view. And the fact that we have such subjective experiences is, is one of the most obvious things to all of us. But then we wonder, are we alone? Do subjective experiences uh, occur for other animals as well? Or is it uniquely human, uniquely primate, uniquely mammalian, or what? I think the starting point for, for my project is this emerging consensus captured in the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness in 2012, that we're not alone. And that the idea that conscious experience is a uniquely human phenomenon is one that should be put to rest, that there's no solid scientific basis for. The declaration said non-human animals, including all mammals and birds, and many other creatures, including octopuses, and I'm sure they argued a lot about octopuses, and I'm glad they included them, possess neurological substrates complex enough to support conscious experiences. And you're nine years on, I think you can say that a recognizable field of animal consciousness research is starting to emerge on the model of how human consciousness science has emerged through the 80s, 90s, through to today. You can see, for example, important landmarks like the founding of the journal Animal Sentience by Stephen Harnad, who previously founded Behavioral and Brain Sciences in 2016. It's a field that I think, you know, just like consciousness science, brings together an interesting mix of disciplines, but the mix is a little bit different. I see it as this blend of cognitive neuroscience, comparative psychology, evolutionary biology, because we're thinking of conscious experience as an evolved phenomenon, animal welfare science, because of course the conscious experiences of animals have great ethical significance and significance for welfare, and philosophy too. Um, and I think philosophy has this role of trying to connect all the other disciplines and trying to place this field on secure foundations. The field does face conceptual and methodological challenges, more than I can cover in this in a single talk. There's two that are particularly interesting that, that I am going to focus on in this talk. You know, one is this question of, should the science of consciousness and if not if you're not going to commit to a specific theory how can that be avoided and a second foundational controversy is should we think of consciousness as something that comes in degrees with some animals more conscious than others are we at the top and you know octopuses further down and maybe bees and crabs and so on even even further down and i'll focus in the first part of the talk on question one and then in the second part on question two 
What I hope is that some of my recent work over the past two years offers some help with those foundational questions. There's two ideas that, that I'm particularly in favor of that I think help. I think there's an idea that helps with question one that I call the facilitation hypothesis and an idea that helps with question two that I call consciousness profiles. And those ideas are set out in, in two recent papers, um, the search for invertebrate consciousness in a journal called Noose and dimensions of animal consciousness in, in trends in cognitive sciences with you know, some of the many wonderful collaborators I've been working on this, this with on this project, uh, Alex Schnell and uh, Nikki Clayton. Certainly one of the pleasures has been, been working with, with not just Alex and Nikki, but, but many other top scientists as well. So let's think about that first question. Should the science of animal consciousness commit to a specific theory of consciousness? Daniel Dennett is someone who's advocated for that in the past. In this paper from 1995, he says, well, you know, how do we turn animal consciousness research into a, into a science rather than just speculation? He says, how could we ever explore these maybes? We could do so in a constructive anchored way by first devising a theory that concentrated exclusively on human consciousness, the one variety about which we will brook no maybes or probablys, you know, implicitly because humans can verbally report their experiences and say, I just experienced that. And then look and see which features of that account apply to which animals and why. I call what, what Dennett is describing here a, a theory heavy approach to animal consciousness. You might also call it a, a human centered approach, I suppose, because it has both features. It's theory heavy and it's human centered. What we're supposed to do is take off the shelf the best supported theory of consciousness in humans and then apply that theory to settle disputes about consciousness in non-human animals. So there's a clear order of precedence there of the two types of research, that the human research has to come first and we have to first develop a well-confirmed theory of consciousness in humans. And then the research on animals is simply then a matter of testing whether the animals meet the, meet the criteria implied by that theory. That, you know, as very much step two. I think this approach faces serious problems. One very obvious problem is, is the current state of human consciousness science, where there's massive disagreement about the correct theory, even in broad outline, as we see from you know, consciousness club meetings of, of the past. Higher order theories don't have a great deal in common with integrated information theory. Global workspace theory is something different again. You get Merkur's midbrain theory, which is another quite distinctive take. One can multiply the very, very different theories for a long time. But also a, 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 a arguably deeper problem is that even if the field did reach consensus about the broad type of theory that was correct, for example, if there was consensus that the higher order view is just wrong and uh, global workspace theory is, is correct, or if there was you know, consensus around integrated information theory or something like that, there'd still be many slight variations of that theory that would have very different implications for animals, such that human evidence doesn't discriminate among these versions. That's a problem that you might call the many versions problem or that Henry Shevlin in a recent paper has called the, the specificity problem. We can illustrate that with, with the case of global workspace theory that is certainly one of the most popular current theories outlined by Stanislas Dehaan in Consciousness and the Brain a few years ago. The theory in broad outline says this, that in humans, information is consciously experienced when it enters the global workspace, which is a mechanism that integrates content from many different sources, perceptual, attentional, evaluative, mnemonic and motor, and broadcasts the integrated content back to the input systems and onwards to a wide range of consumer systems. So there's that hypothesis about the cognitive architecture that supports conscious experience. And also for, for Dehaan and collaborators, uh, an accompanying neuronal hypothesis about how that architecture is implemented through pyramidal neurons and prefrontal cortex and global ignition and so forth. The basic idea captured in this, 
often reproduced diagram from 1998. You can see all of those local processes interconnected uh, in the global workspace. The problem is, you know, suppose we could all agree that that was the correct theory of human consciousness, and we can't, but suppose we could all agree, we'd still have this problem of, you know, which precise set of conditions does a non-human animal have to meet to be conscious according to this theory? Because no non-human animal is going to possess the whole human global broadcast network. Some aspects will be different even in our closest relatives and even in you know, other non-human primates. And the differences will just get greater as you then look to other mammals and to birds and to octopuses and to insects. Some aspects of that network will be missing the input systems and the consumer systems will vary across species. For example, the perceptual processes that would be feeding into the version of this architecture in an octopus would be incredibly different from the, the sensitive perceptual processes feeding into ours. And the neuronal implementation is almost certainly going to vary substantially as well, because as soon as we look beyond mammals, we're really not looking for a, a neocortical implementation at all. You know, birds have quite similar structures, but without the laminated structure of the cortex, the, the so-called uh, dorsal pallium. But once you go beyond birds to, to fish and so on, you are talking about species where there's nothing you can point to that is even closely resembles the mammalian neocortex. So the input systems and the consumer systems will vary and the neuronal implementation will vary too, although you might still have integrative stuff going on. So we'd face that question, which parts of the human global broadcast network are indispensable for generating conscious experience? How much of this can you change? How much of it can you rip, knock out or replace and still have conscious experience there? And you can imagine many different versions of the theory that all take different views about this question. You can have a version of the theory on which Consciousness depends in a very fragile way on the particular architecture we have. You know, change the implementation even slightly, and it's no longer sufficient for, for conscious experience. You could also have a version of the theory on which basically anything global workspace-ish suffices for conscious experience, anything that connects local processes. And then you start to wonder, well, won't even incredibly simple organisms like C. elegans have, you know, integrative systems of some kind. Many different versions of the theory, and of course, many intermediate views possible as well. And you know, as Shevlin and myself and Peter Carruthers as well have pointed out, it seems like there's a real, uh, very, it's really very unlikely that human evidence will be able to tell between those versions. And so even if we could agree that global workspace theory was correct, we would be rather in the dark about which non-human animals are, are conscious. And I think similar points can be made for other theories as well. If integrated information theory is your thing, well, just imagine the crucial threshold of phi that you take to be sufficient for consciousness. Is it that you know, any non-zero phi is enough? Then you have to be incredibly liberal in where you attribute consciousness, including thermostats, diodes, et cetera. Or are you going to say there's a critical threshold and if there's a critical threshold, there, there's many different versions of the theory all setting different thresholds. So there's some real concerns here that massive disagreement, even if we could resolve the disagreement in broad terms in favor of one general type of theory, we'd still uh, be massively underdetermining the, the questions we want to answer about animal consciousness. So that strategy outlined by Dennett of first using human evidence to find the right theory and then simply applying it just doesn't seem like it's going to work. But then on the other hand, you get a widespread and I think reasonable fear that how can there even be a science of animal consciousness without a theory? Isn't the science of animal consciousness going to be left rudderless? I mean, choose your preferred sort of maritime metaphor here, because Dennett talked about it being anchored in a theory. So you can think of it as anchorless without one, or you can think of it as, as, as rudderless. Um, but to me, you know, this idea of the science is not going to be sufficiently constrained or guided is, is, is a real concern.
Matthias Michel in his recent papers has uh, you know, outlined that concern in a, in a nice way. He talks about the example of paramecia and says, well, you know, what's the source of constraint here? What is going to, if you don't have an underlying theory, what is going to stop you ascribing consciousness to organisms like paramecia that are single celled? He writes, the unicellular organism covered with several thousand cilia can exhibit pain-like behaviours. If a paramecium encounters a potentially dangerous salt solution or acetic acid, it will back away and swim in a different direction or engage in defensive behaviour. It could be that paramecia realise pain in a yet unknown way. And I think Matthias probably has his tongue in cheek when he's writing that because he's saying, well, you can't have a science that you know is like this, where you can conjecture very freely that you know maybe plants are conscious, maybe single-celled organisms are conscious. Who knows? That's not um, that's not a scientific research program. So how do we avoid these extremes of you know commit committing too heavily to a theory that then can't settle the questions we want to answer, versus not having a theory at all and engaging in uh, you know, unconstrained speculation. Well, that's basically the, the problem I've been thinking about and that I write about in this, this paper, The Search for Invertebrate Consciousness. The, the thought I have is that we can base the science on a, on a rudder, on a guiding hypothesis, but one that is more general than any specific theory and that is in fact compatible with all currently popular theories. So we don't need to commit to any specific theory to get a, an empirical research program off the ground. What I think we, we can commit to and should commit to is this very general hypothesis about what conscious experience does, specifically what conscious perception does, that I call the facilitation hypothesis. The hypothesis that conscious perception of a stimulus facilitates relative to unconscious perception a cluster of cognitive or perceptual abilities in relation to that stimulus. I think this is something that, that people can get behind regardless of what sort of theoretical approach they are inclined towards. So it's, it's committing to less than any particular theory, but it's also giving us enough to guide an empirical research program. Just a couple of comments on what's meant by facilitation that when I talk about conscious perception facilitating a cluster of abilities, what I don't mean is that they're things we can't do unconsciously. I think it's very hard to actually point to anything where we can be confident that we can't do it unconsciously. And so it would be over committing to say there are various things that we can't do unconsciously. What I mean by facilitation is that we can do it more quickly or reliably when perception is conscious rather than uh, unconscious and then this hypothesis you know it has the status of a hypothesis that is intended to structure an empirical research program not something that is guaranteed a priori to be true it's not it's clearly not a priori it's not a priori because you can conceive of the possibility of conscious experience serving no function at all uh, you can conceive of epiphenomenalism the view on which uh, experience has no function. It's conceivable, but just not empirically plausible. Um, I think not remotely empirically plausible. It's very reasonable to think conscious perception is an evolved phenomenon that must serve some function, some function that led it to be shaped by natural selection to have the richly you know, structured features it has, but that you know, then we turn to consciousness science for an empirically plausible hypothesis about what the function is. And that's what the facilitation hypothesis is supposed to capture. It's intended to be something that is empirically motivated by the broad trajectory of consciousness science over the past 40 years, that despite all of the disagreement about different theories, and there is a huge amount of disagreement, there's a strong trend towards this, the facilitation hypothesis, being correct. Now, what's the sort of program this hypothesis structures? Well, it's one on which evidence from humans is still incredibly important because evidence from humans is needed to tell us what those abilities are. And it does so defeasibly, you know, tentatively, 
in, in a way that is subject to, to sort of empirical defeat. But I think we can think about what abilities might be plausibly facilitated by conscious perception according to current evidence. And it's actually a reasonably long list. And just a reminder of the link to the slides, because no one's going to memorize this list, but bit.ly slash birchcc. Put quite a lot of things here where either direct empirical evidence or inferences that are somewhat more indirect have been used to argue that an ability is facilitated by conscious perception. For example, a striking recent paper by Scorer et al. suggesting that uh, you know, any instrumental conditioning, there's results from Pesilioni et al. in the 2000s suggesting it can be done unconsciously, but Scorer et al. argue it is facilitated by conscious perception. So when you perceive a stimulus consciously, you are better at instrumental conditioning than you would be when it was perceived unconsciously. There's also the literature from Clark and Squire and collaborators in the early 2000s on trace conditioning, which is learning across temporal gaps. You might learn, for example, that a stimulus is followed a second later by a puff of air in your eye. And the challenge is, can you learn to time your blink to blink one second after the stimulus? And Clark and Squire's results seem to suggest that, of course, humans can learn this, but this ability to learn the temporal relation, this predicts this by one second, is facilitated by conscious perception. They, they could find you know, subjects doing it very easily when the stimulus was consciously perceived and couldn't find evidence of them doing it at all when the stimulus was, was not consciously perceived. Ginsberg and Jablonka in their book, uh, Evolution of the Sensitive Soul and their work on this, argue so in a more indirect way that second order conditioning, where you're learning not just the association between A and B, but then a further link between B and C, and then the link between C and A, is an ability that is, um, likely to be facilitated by conscious perception. There was a paper by uh, Travers, uh, Shea and Frith, local hero Chris Frith from, from 2017, showing that you know, reversal learning, you know, where something predicts, uh, you know, if you imagine a directed cue, so an arrow pointing this way, um, you know, one stage of the experiment, it predicts that a target is going to appear in the direction it points, and then you reverse the association, and now it predicts a stimulus appearing in the opposite direction to the direction from which it points. Subjects can, of course, learn the reversal, you know, that the, the stimulus contingency is reverse, but it seems like you know, conscious perception greatly facilitates that. It's very difficult to do when the stimulus is, is masked. Cross-modal integration, there's some debate about that, and there was some conflicting evidence from Scott et al. suggesting that cross-modal integration of, you know, sort of like a, a sound with a, with, a, with a visual stimulus could be done unconsciously. I nonetheless think the evidence points towards it being facilitated by conscious perception, maybe possible without it, but facilitated with it. Nick Shea and Cecilia Hayes argued in a 2010 paper that Metacognition, particularly metacognition that could be generalized to new contexts. So cognition about, for example, you know, do I remember seeing that, but then generalized to new, to new contexts, not just the original task in which it's learned, is something facilitated by conscious perception. And there's some literature as well suggesting that certain kinds of perceptual phenomena, so, you know, it, Aspects of the construction of 3D scenes from 2D displays are facilitated by conscious perception as well. For example, the evidence that the, the Ponzo illusion, which is the converging train tracks illusion, resembles a train track going off into the distance. And if you put an e you know, equally sized dots, one at the point of convergence and one at the point where they're furthest apart, you will perceive the one that is uh, at the point of convergence as being larger because your, your brain constructs it as being further away. You know? That illusion seems to be 
switched off or at least greatly reduced when the uh, when the stimulus is masked. So we've got this whole pattern that to me points towards a diverse and interesting cluster of cognitive and perceptual abilities that are all facilitated by perceiving a stimulus consciously. And that's what the sort of thing the facilitation hypothesis is describing. It's not saying we need to commit right now to knowing exactly what the abilities are. So that list could change. And I think that list will change. You know, there's new evidence every year. I wouldn't have put instrumental conditioning on the list last year until that score et al paper came out. So the list is subject to change, but the idea of there being such a list, of there being this cluster of abilities that is facilitated, I think is something that can be a point of consensus. And then the proposal is we, you know, we base a research program into animal consciousness on that. And this is a vision in which the science of human consciousness and the science of animal consciousness proceed in tandem with each other. So rather than this sequential picture that Dennett was giving us in that passage, where we first do lots of human consciousness science until we're in a position to simply apply our theories to animals. Then we go and look at wide range of animals. No, no, instead, we do both things in tandem. We need human consciousness science to build up an increasingly accurate picture of what conscious perception facilitates in us. We shouldn't think we have a complete picture, we don't. But at the same time, we need to be looking at a wide range of non-human animals, looking for those same abilities to find if they form a natural cluster that is associated with a distinctive kind of processing. So for example, you can look at bees and that there's an experimental part of my project that um, and, you know, Andrew Crump is, is leading that he, he's, he's, he's in this seminar and could answer questions on it later if you want to ask about that. Where we're looking at bees in, uh, in Lars Chitka's lab at Queen Mary in London and asking, well, how many of these abilities on the list can we find? Oh, you know, some, of, some they're already known to be extremely good at and others not so much like metacognition, the uh, you know, trace conditioning, cross-modal integration. So we're just, you know, Ponzo illusion. No one knows whether they're susceptible to the Ponzo illusion or not. So we've been designing experiments to try and probe the, you know, how many of these abilities the bees actually have. And then the next question, what you've got when you've got to that stage is, are those abilities associated with a distinctive kind of perceptual processing that is not necessarily implicated in simpler abilities? Can we find evidence of two streams, as it were, two perceptual streams? One perceptual stream that is facilitating all of these same things, and then one perceptual stream that isn't. That sort of research can then feed back into human consciousness science by saying, yeah, 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 you're onto something here. In the huge, you know, we've what we've got here is a distinctive kind of processing that is found across a wide range of species that always tends to facilitate this package of enhanced abilities. And that in, that in turn can inform the, the construction of better theories of what consciousness is that are otherwise, you know, if they're based on human evidence alone, they're greatly underdetermined, as I've emphasized. But with this sort of evidence as well, they can then be much less underdetermined. So the relation between the two fields that I'm envisaging here is really one of interdependence, not one way dependence. It's not that human consciousness scientists try to construct the best theories they can, and then the animal researchers apply those theories. But rather, there's this feedback where human consciousness science aims to come up with a better and better picture of what conscious perception facilitates in the human case. And then the animal researchers go and look for those clusters of abilities across species to see if they're linked to a distinctive kind of processing. So that's a sort of a vision for the future, I suppose. You can also talk about what would be the best case outcome of this kind of research program, where you could imagine a situation in which we find a diverse cluster of abilities, let's say metacognitive, perceptual, learning abilities, that are on the one hand robustly facilitated by conscious perception in humans, and on the other hand, also robustly facilitated by a distinctive kind of processing and let's not prejudge the question of what that is, you know, insert your favorite hypothesis, global ignition, recurrent processing or whatever, but facilitated by a distinctive kind of processing across a wide range of species, not just in our own case, or just primates 
or just mammals. And then if we got that kind of profile of evidence, I think we'd be in a much stronger position than we are now to make an inference to the best explanation. An inference that on the one hand, you know, that cluster of abilities that is facilitated by conscious perception in our own case is facilitated by conscious perception uh, in general. And that that distinctive kind of processing that we've identified in all these cases that is conscious perception. You know, and that, that's going to tell us what the right theory of consciousness is. There's no guarantee of that. That's the best case outcome. But I think what, what, what I do hope now is that a sustained attempt would enrich both fields and that greater interdependence and greater kind of crosstalk between human and animal consciousness research is something that would enrich uh, both fields. So that was, you know, remember question one was, what should the theoretical commitments of animal consciousness research be? And I've suggested there's no need to commit to a specific theory. What we can do instead is commit to the facilitation hypothesis, which I think can be a point of consensus. Question two, now that other foundational question, should we think of consciousness as coming in degrees with some animals more conscious than others? I'm going to turn to that question now. So that's the topic of another recent paper. I think there's an important lesson here from the science of human consciousness in keeping with this theme of the two fields talking to each other. The concept of levels of consciousness plays an important role in diagnosing disorders of consciousness. And it might be tempting to think we could try to construct a similar scale for animals, presumably not the same scale, but we might try to carry across that concept of conscious level from the human case to the animal case. That just as there might be these levels of coma, anesthesia, deep sleep, light sleep, drowsiness, conscious wakefulness, maybe there's a level that has, you know, mammals, birds, fish, and so on. But I'm quite skeptical of that. Critics in the human case have argued that a scale with one or even two dimensions neglects important dimensions of variation. There was a paper called Are There Levels of Consciousness by Tim Bain uh, and co in uh, 2016 in Trends and Cognitive Sciences that made this case. And, and that you know, when, it, when I read it made quite an impact on me. They argue that if you try to flatten everything out onto a one or two dimensional scale like this, you miss clinically important dimensions of variation that are actually needed to properly care for people with um, brain injuries. They suggest what would be better here is to construct multi-dimensional consciousness profiles for minimally conscious states that have potentially five to eight dimensions. You don't wanna let the number of dimensions proliferate indefinitely because then you get something that's no longer clinically useful but you don't want to just stick to one or two either because then you're losing information that actually really matters. And I think that's a great point in the case of the, um, the minimally conscious state, but I also think it applies at least as, as clearly to the case of non-human animals, where once again, you know, if we try to compress all of the variation in conscious states onto a single scale, we're going to miss important dimensions of variation that actually matter. And that's the theme that I take up with my collaborators in this paper on dimensions of animal consciousness. Our aim in, in the paper is to sort of start a conversation, start a discussion. We're not saying we know what the right dimensions are, but we're making a proposal about five dimensions of variation that might help organize future inquiry in a useful way that we call perceptual richness, evaluative richness, unity, temporality, and selfhood. And another aim is to argue that existing evidence already provides some insight for these, the corvids, crows, ravens, and so on, and uh, cephalopods like octopuses, squid, cuttlefish where even though it's, it's, it's often said that animal consciousness is, is a young field, and that's, that's right, um, there's a huge amount of existing evidence that was you know, from experiments done for other reasons that actually, when you think about it, is relevant 
to some of these dimensions. And we also aim to set out experimental strategies that are inspired by human consciousness science for gaining more insight. So just as I think we need this interdependence of human and animal consciousness science to build better theories of consciousness for the reasons I've just described, I also think you know, animal consciousness researchers looking to study dimensions of variation, like you know, how does a how does a crow's experience of the world differ from an octopus's? Need to draw inspiration from human consciousness science to probe those questions. I don't have time in this talk to talk about all five of the dimensions um, that are discussed in the paper, so I'll just zoom in on one, which is the dimension of unity, which I find particularly interesting to think about. It's the integration of an animal's conscious state at a given moment in time. Human experience is normally highly unified. I talked about the subjective point of view at the beginning and how our point of view is not simply visual, but there's also all the senses and emotions and our thoughts and our memories and everything all unified into a integrated conscious state. It's well known from the human case that that normal state of high unity is one that doesn't always obtain. It breaks down, for example, in the, in the so-called split brain syndrome, where patients have had the corpus callosum surgically cut. It's an extreme treatment they used to do for epilepsy. And then disunity can be revealed in various ways books such as Elizabeth Schechter's book Self-Consciousness and Split Brains that review that literature and there's these famous experiments where you know you ask someone to report what they've seen verbally and they report whatever is in the the, the right visual field and then you ask them to report whatever they've seen by by drawing with the left hand and they report what is in the the left visual field and there seems to be no uh, sort of inter-access, so you, they can't draw what is going into the, the uh, left hemisphere and they can't say what is going into the right hemisphere. And we can draw on this literature for designing experiments to probe the unity of consciousness in animals. The test hypotheses like these, and these, you know, these are very tentative hypotheses, but you might hypothesize, for example, that subjective experience in mammals might be more unified than in birds due to the greater interhemispheric connectivity. Birds do not have an analog of the corpus callosum. The two hemispheres of the dorsal pallium are not linked, although there's plenty of, of subpallial connections, just as you get plenty of subcortical connections in, in mammals. We might hypothesize that their experience is going to be disunified as a result. And we might try to probe that in a similar way. And then you get to the octopus where you might also hypothesize tentatively that subjective experience in, in uh, mammals or birds is more unified than in octopods due to the you know, really quite different organization of the nervous system in octopods, where you do have uh, lateralization of the central brain, but then in addition to the central brain, you also have a nerve ring, the brach brachial plexus, that joins up all the arms and contains a substantial amount of nervous tissue outside of the brain. And then you have nerve centers in the arms themselves. And you might hypothesize uh, even greater disunity in that case. But a lot of you know, these hypotheses haven't really been tested in any sustained way. Existing evidence, well, the unihemispheric sleep is quite an interesting source of existing evidence that of course, when we sleep, both of our hemispheres sleep at once. And you might think, isn't that always the case? But no, it isn't, not even in dolphins or seals. There's evidence of unihemispheric sleep. It makes you wonder even if some of our fellow mammals might have, uh, you know, might be more like the split brain patients than like uh, a human with an intact corpus callosum. There's also very suggestive evidence of interocular transfer Interocular transfer is this question of if something is presented to um, one eye, you know, and, and part of the visual field that is not accessible to the other eye, can whatever is learned still be transferred across to the case 
where the same stimulus is presented to the other part of the visual field. And this uh, often seems to fail in birds. The, the work of Ono Gunterkin and, and colleagues points towards it often failing, but not always. So the picture is, is quite mixed and there seem to be you know, at least two visual pathways in, in pigeons, just to say you know, at least two visual pathways in, in mammals, but you know, pathways where, where one of them is much more unified across the hemispheres than the, than the other. Um, that's an obvious source for further research that would be fantastic to see. So some existing evidence, but we can also get a sense of what would provide more insight, which is more experiments inspired by those carried out on split brain humans, and that need not require verbal report, but rather simply behaviors. You know, think of the role that drawing plays in those traditional experiments on humans. What we need is to find behaviors controlled by uh, the left hemisphere and a different behavior controlled by the right, and ask are the stimuli presented to one visual hemisphere made accessible for the guidance of behavior by both or just one. Experiments like that would give us ways of probing what are currently quite speculative hypotheses about birds and octopuses. So that's one of the five dimensions and the paper basically does this times five um, for, for all of the different dimensions. But let's zoom back out now to what the long-term goal is here. I think, you know, I introduced that idea of should we be trying to sort species on a level, on a scale from more conscious to less conscious? And I think not. I think let's not even see that as a goal. What we want to do is try and construct profiles based on interesting dimensions of variation. So we can make comparative assessments along each of these five dimensions, ideally with a standardized battery of tests. Ideally, we would have standardized tests for saying, well, you know, it's the, it's the experience of of a mammal more, it's more unified than an experience of, of, of a bird. And then aim to construct consciousness profiles based on how they've scored along each dimension. The long-term vision would be profiles that look like this, where these are hypothetical, but you know, evidence is already informing these, these hypothetical profiles and we can, we can see the sort of evidence that would allow us to refine them more and to say you know, more refined, more precise things um, about the different dimensions. Of course, we may find that as the evidence builds up, our view of what the right dimensions are changes. And we've got this initial proposal of, you know, perceptual richness, evaluative richness, unity, temporality, selfhood. That might be refined over time. We might find, for example, that we really, you know, it's useful to split some of these dimensions into finer grain dimensions and to have perhaps, you know, uh, you know, more different categories. But that's fine. That's all just, that's part of the course of empirical inquiry. We don't have to commit at this stage to specific dimensions. If you remember, it's, it's similar to what I was saying earlier, where I was saying, we don't need to commit to what specific abilities are facilitated by conscious perception. We can let the evidence guide us, but we can appropriately commit to there being some, some cluster of abilities. In the same way, I don't think we're in a position to commit now to say we know what the right dimensions of variation are going to be, but I think we can say let's structure a research program around the idea that there are such dimensions and that our goal here is to construct consciousness profiles, not to decide which species are more conscious than others. And I think we should accept too that these dimensions of variation will be in a sense uh, incommensurable, which is to say you know, they're apples and oranges. They can't be easily put on a single scale that allows aggregation. So I think, you know, when we're drawing radar plots like this, we should not interpret the area as giving us how conscious the animal is. I think we should stop asking that question altogether and accept there's not really a fact of the matter about how conscious the animal is. What you can say is here's the structure of its profile along the interesting dimensions of variation. So, you know, two ideas to help with those two foundational questions. What should the theoretical commitments of animal consciousness research be? Let's not commit to a specific theory, but we can commit to the facilitation hypothesis. And should we be trying to rank animals as more conscious than others? No, that's not the goal we should set ourselves. 
what we should try to do instead is construct consciousness profiles reflecting many different dimensions of variation. So I hope those ideas, you know, are helpful ideas, even though there's clearly a lot of work to do to actually pursue those programs over the long term. Here's the links to the papers and a reminder that the link to the slides, if you want that bit is bit.ly slash birchcc. And thanks very much for your attention. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Jonathan. So first of all, we should unmute and give you a round of applause for a fantastic talk. That's nice.